we've been talking about for <coughs> seven or eight months, I think. Now. Right. Yeah. So I'll take about ten minutes, maybe, and uh, talk about Ontario's role in immigration. So, um, Chris, is this my? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So first thing I'll say is the federal government selects most immigrants to Canada. Like maybe three hundred fifty thousand immigrants will come next year. Um, Ontario gets to pick 6,650 thereabouts. And I think we have another uh, 250 in uh, what's called Knox C. Um, we're able to do this by virtue of an agreement with the government of Canada that allows us to have what's called the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. And that's a program Christy talked about temporary residents and permanent residents. Our OIMP is a permanent residence program. So it's not about getting the uh, foreign worker here temporarily, it's about keeping them here. And our program breaks down into the three main categories. Now, I think, you know, Chris had told me a little bit about difficulty in um, getting skilled workers here. So I think, you know, Three main buckets, employer job offer. That means we won't nominate, we do something called nominate a person for permanent residence. So we don't give them permanent residence, but if they apply to us, we uh, and they qualify for one of our uh, streams, then we give them what's called a nomination. And that nomination allows a couple of things. Um, gets them a letter of, that allows them to get a work permit. And, and they also take that nomination and apply to the government of Canada for permanent residence. So, uh, employer job offer, that category is probably the most relevant for what, for your purposes today. It's based, we'll nominate somebody if you've found a foreign national and <coughs> you're willing to offer them a permanent full time job. The other, the Second big category is called human capital. So the government of Canada has something called the express entry system. It's a pool where foreign nationals express their interest, register their interest to come to Canada permanently. And uh, Christie's department, IRCC, they go into that pool for the regularly and pull out, invite people to apply for permanent residence. The Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program can also go into that pool and pull people out. So we do that um, based on them having the right mix um, of language, job work experience, age is a big thing. Uh, the, that Everybody in that pool is scored on different factors and they're all ranked. The government of Canada goes in and picks all the, the top tier people. But then, you know like age, let's take age for example. Age is uh, the government of Canada's age gets a lot of points the younger you are in that express entry system because if that, the younger that person is when they come here, I guess the longer they have to sort of become uh, economically established and can pay taxes and contribute. Uh, but there are a lot of people in that pool who don't get picked by the government of Canada but who are uh, really good. So we go in and we try to find those people. And then the final category we have is business. Uh, and I'll talk with you just a little bit about the entrepreneur stream. You can apply as a foreign national to come as an entrepreneur, and you're, that person commits to making a minimum investment in Ontario and creating a minimum number of jobs. And uh, if they're successful in doing that, then we will not be permanent residents. So, big thing here three main categories, about 10 different streams. The one that's maybe most relevant for, uh, for you today is what a job offer. So generally, with the employer job offer, uh, you're an Ontario employer, you found somebody, that foreign national, you want to hire them permanently. The job offer has to be full time, so that's things like 37 and a half hours uh, a week. Uh, for our four, what we call the foreign worker stream and international student streams, the job has to be not O. A or B. O is generally management, 
A, uh, you generally require a university degree. B, often uh, two years of post-secondary uh, certificate of a couple of years. Those are considered highly skilled positions. We also have something called the in-demand skill stream. That allows, they're not called highly skilled positions, but they are skilled positions. We have right now seven to eight uh, occupations that are eligible. We're proposing them to, to add two more in July, uh, one for person support workers, one for partners. And at times, the employ Ontario employer needs to show that they've made efforts to recruit uh, the foreign national if they're visiting Canada or if they're outside Canada. Oh, uh, just a little detail on each of those employer job offer streams. Foreign worker stream. The worker needs two years of experience in that field, in the, in the occupation you want to hire them for. The international students, they don't need any uh, experience. That's a, a neat category. Uh, they, the student needs to obtain a degree or a certificate from a qualified institution. But then, if, if you found them and, and you feel like they can do the job, then um, they don't need work experience. You can, you can nominate right away. And then the in-demand skill stream. The slide right now, as, as it stands now, one year of Ontario work experience is required for us to nominate, but we're proposing to lower that to nine months. Uh, you can see the eligible occupations here. They generally break down into construction and agriculture, so I heard there's at least one person in the room that's uh, farming. So we'd love to know more about uh, farming needs and, you know, uh, Perhaps I would not see that in demand skill stream could be useful. The supporting individual slide, that's about, you know, I said earlier there's a human capital stream, we go into that, or a human capital category, we go into the express entry system and pull people out. Uh, these are some of these people, so uh, we'll go in and uh, look for different attributes of people. Maybe they're working in a particular sector. Uh, and they have the, the cert, within the skill uh, score range that we're looking for, we'll, we'll invite them to apply. That doesn't Im benefit uh, Ontario employers immediately because we're not going in based on uh, particular employer need. We're going into the pool and inviting people to apply who generally uh, have the, you know, if Ontario employers need, let's say we need aerospace technicians or whatever, then if, we, if there's enough evidence for us to feel like, yeah, there's a, well, a general a need for that, then we'll go into that pool for aerospace people. We'll talk about entrepreneur. I'll just put up this really confusing uh, <laughs> slide. We I think the message here is a couple of things. Uh, there are many different what you see here is three, you're going to call the column wise, three columns, three different pathways to permanent residence. In each one of these, the person has come in temporarily. Uh, so the first one, uh, Christy talked about the global skills strategy. The Ontario Group Nominee Program is a, a referral partner for that strategy. So uh, let's say if you, if you want to hire somebody and they don't have a work permit in Canada, for Canada, and they never worked for you before, they're going to need a labor market impact assessment. And those normally take, well, I don't know, you hear lots of different things, but they can take three months, four months, five months, six months. It takes a long time. And they cost, I think it's $1,000 per LMIA, per position, I believe. Per position, yeah. Per position. We, but if the person qualifies under the global skills strategy, uh, global talent stream, uh, we can refer for expedited processing. You would come to us and say, hey, I've found this highly skilled individual. The company needs to be one that's an innovative, growing, scaling, and they need to find this, uh, they need this person, this highly skilled person to sort of help the company make, take that next step in their growth. 
that's the kind of person, kind of company you are, and the kind of person you need. You can contact us in, in three business days, try to look at the case, see if it qualifies, and make a referral to ESTC. If ESTC accepts our referral, uh, the LMIA gets processed in 10 business days. You get someone from ESTC who, who works with you. To well, they also, you don't have to do the advertising. The advertising. Yeah. You get to skip that stuff. So lots of advantages of going through being referred. And then once, if somebody has the uh, LMIA to the Global Skills Strategy, <laughs> IRCC presses their application 10 business days. So instead of three, four, five, six months, they can be here or ready to come in one month. So we are a referral partner for that. <coughs> so let's say we do make a referral, you get the person here, they're really working out for you. Well, there's a few different ways they can become a permanent resident. <coughs> One is they can uh, register their interest in the Express Entry Pool. And if they score high enough, the government of Canada will invite them to apply. And they'll have permanent residence in six months. That's a ideal ideal situation. But there'll be other uh, situations where maybe they're in the express entry pool but they don't have enough points to be drawn by, by uh, the Government of Canada. You can then turn to us and say, do they qualify for one of your streams? So, employer job offer, uh, we can, you can apply directly to, to us and uh, as long as they have that two years work experience and they're here working and they, there's not even a language requirement for that. You don't have to write a language test. It's sort of highly based on what the employer thinks. Now, they can get permanent residence through us or a nomination through us, uh, which then guarantees, practically speaking, guarantees them permanent residence from the government of Canada unless they have a health or, or security issue. So I will go through all, each column, but what I will say is. You know, this shows a couple of things. It shows that our, our uh, graphic skills aren't great, so uh, <laughs> we got to fix that. Uh, second thing, shows that it can be complicated. <coughs> Lots of different ways to go for temporary or permanent residence. But we also, you can call us and we'll try to guide you through it. Uh, and that's my contact info here and Tim Osborne, uh, who I work with every day at the office. He's also uh, available and we're uh, working to train up more people uh, so that we can, this is not legal advice. Uh, if you need legal advice, you've got to go to someone, someone who's currently licensed and insured to be practicing law. Um, I'm licensed but I'm not insured so I'm not, uh, I'm not paid to be a lawyer right now so uh, I can't give you legal advice but I can we can sort of give you, like, point you in the right direction and be a sounding board for you. And we'll probably tell you, like, straight away, it really doesn't look, look promising or, yeah, this sounds like something that's really viable and here's probably your one or two options. In certain circumstances, on the Global Skills Strategy, we can refer you to IRCC's designated search channel. And they can give you, uh, they can actually give you better uh, or more advice that you can count on, because it's their program. So, to help, to help you navigate the system. So, that, that's the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are going to be taking some questions now. And what I will do for a few minutes as well is to think of some case studies to kind of uh, so that at least we can, you can talk, speak in generalities, but at least you can give us some idea as to how we would um, address some of the questions. You can come up because I, you both are going to be taking questions. But one of the things that I would like to, to find out is because uh, I keep hearing that, oh, I hear I must hire a lawyer, I must get a lawyer, and if I'm going to spend $1,000 on LMIA and then $5,000 per person, with a, with a lawyer, then I'm looking at how much for 10 people and so on and so forth. Do they, do, would the employer have to hire a lawyer? No. You don't have to, but how much, how much is it worth to you yeah. to get it done right yeah. and as fast as possible? 
You know, you can sell your own house. But how many people do really, right? You don't want to you want to get maximize the value of your house. So uh, I know. It, I just I would add if you if you qualify under global skills strategy, you should not be a lawyer because we will walk yeah. you through every step. The trick is getting to the local school strategy yeah. and get it to the designated service person. I know even now, after 11 years, I go on these websites and I'm lost in the battle. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not lost in the war, but I can see how people could get lost. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know which, which stream you go for. Now, but it is true that if you uh, have the time and the inclination and the ability to go in there and spend a lot of hours try to navigate this thing and you can call us and we can try to help, but we'll, we'll again say we're not giving you legal advice, right? Yeah. Um, then it's possible and you can try, the, there's a toll free number for people in Canada, for the government of Canada, you can call you, can call call you right? <laughs> the client <laughs> service line is, isn't always the easiest option. We have put better tools on our website yeah. to try and help employers navigate where they should be going or what path they should be taking. Um, I would absolutely encourage any um, employer to work with their economic development um, agencies in their area and find out who their referral partners are and find out what the qualifications are because our qualifications, we just actually renewed all of our MOUs um, because ESDC, for them, the Global Skills Strategy was a pilot. They've now implemented it um, uh, permanently. So we've revamped some of those qualifications for significant investment. I've heard, I've heard it said just that uh, you, know, you can figure out 85% of it fairly quickly on your own, but it's that 15% that could really so yeah. can trip you up. Yeah, for sure. And I guess my cautionary you know, advice to everybody is if you're going to use an immigration consultant, to make sure they are registered. There are, we have heard so many horror stories of people, personal and employers, hiring immigration consultants who you know, promise them the world and couldn't deliver, or yeah, yeah, and they got taken advantage of. So and make sure if you have one, you're registered. And likewise, for the lawyers. With our department, we list all of our registered consultants. Yeah, our department has a registry of, of recognized uh, immigration consultants. The Law Society of, uh, of Ontario has a list of specialists in immigration and in refugee law on their website too, but. You, you want to like you don't just want to go to a lawyer and ask. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go to an immigration lawyer, and and not even an immigration lawyer, but a business immigration lawyer, who's you know if you ever talk to an immigration lawyer, you call up one of those people. You want to say how many work permits have you done in the last year or labor market impact assessments? Yeah. Most immigration lawyers work. With, a high number of them are working with refugees or or yeah. temporary uh, resident applications, disposal applications, things like that. The work permit issue is, is a very niche issue, even within the legal communities. You want to make sure you're getting the right lawyers. And just to <laughs> expand a little bit on um, what Christy uh, said, I, I were, I'm part of the Economic Development Department, and so very often we will have clients that will call us and say, I'm looking to, um, I can't find local workers, I'm looking to bring workers from abroad. And we will literally visit with you, do the, um, conference call with the ministry, go through the questions. So we will do some of the legwork to go through and have you connect to whoever our reps are to go to the system, but I mean, that's how far our resources can stretch, right? Okay, so um, one of the, one of the um, problem child is welders, for example. Um, I have been visiting a number of our businesses and one of the things I could hire 50 welders right now. What uh, we, we can't find them and so on and so forth. If I spend the money, this thousand dollars that I I have my LMIA and I bring this worker in, are they gonna be working with me specifically or can somebody poach that person from me? Okay, so there's a couple things that can happen with that. Okay, so let's say you're an employer and you need welders and we know welders are a skilled trade. First thing I would say um, is send me an email and tell me. Um, I will then go to my international colleagues and say, hey, what country has a big plethora of welders that maybe we can pull from? And they'll come back to me and say, I'm uh, making this up, let's say it's Greece, all right? So Greece has a whole bunch of welders that, you know, that we, we may want to tap into. 
So then I would contact the employer and say, okay, this is maybe who you can contact overseas. They're the recruiting agency. They are looking at having all these welders. So when you, spot, if you are sponsoring somebody to come over, they're issued a work permit, but that is an employer specific work permit, which means they, they can't, you, they're not beholden to you, they can leave, but they have to apply for another work permit. So they can't just like jump to another job, right? But it works both ways. You as an employer are not necessarily stuck with an employee that's not working out. You can decide to terminate the contract and that, that person then can apply to get a work permit for another employer or they can return home. Um, and, and it works vice versa. So if they want to terminate their contract with you and go on to another employer, legally they can do that. We can't, like human rights are still applicable even in temporary residence. Um, so we would allow that, but they would have to justify why, right? Like what's happened, what this, like why this relationship with this employer didn't work and why they want to move to another employer. So, uh, but another employer can't just like show up and be like, hey, just come over here. And then tomorrow the guy starts working for somebody else. Like it takes months to switch in, right? But, but again, people are entitled to all human rights. So yeah, they're absolutely allowed, but there's a process. Okay, and the question, and then other questions? <coughs> Yep. apply, for example, in an area where um, uh, agricultural workers are, are, are in, in demand. Yes. Um, so the job description is really the same. The LLMIA is the same. Yeah. Um, would that be an eligible business to apply for um, to help to get um, those skill strategies? Sure. Um, I have a, let's say I have a technical that I attempt out foreign workers in agriculture, and I bring a group in, and then I... So it would depend on the NOC level you're looking at, because again, to get those specialized services, we're looking at more NOC O, A, and B. Now, that's not to say agriculture doesn't apply to that. I'll give you an example. We were working with an employer who was looking at growing his farm, and he wanted to take on uh, a whole other uh, types of animals on his farm. Uh, so he needed to find a veterinarian. And he could not find the specific type of veterinarian he was looking for within Canada, but he found one overseas. And because he was growing his business, because he was going to be employing more temporary workers, but his need was for a high skill worker, he then got the referral to the Global Skill Strategy, and he got those dedicated services. Because he had that high skill need. He now can use that for some of his other needs, because once you get referred, you have an account manager. But you have to have that high skill need initially to get the referral. I don't. I don't think. Uh, depending on what the the need was, what the occupation possibility had, right? Yeah. I think that you like a recruitment agency. I'm talking Norfolk County. Okay, Norfolk County. Yeah. A lot of farmers. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe a few of some foreign uh, workers coming in to help people bring the crop to harvest. We've got some farmers in the room, right? Yeah. So farmer A might need them for this many months, and then there's a bit of a downtime. The farmer B over here can use those people for the downtime, right? But they're not going to be doing a, a new LMIA for the two months that they might need them. I'm thinking, what if an overarching recruitment agency for foreign farmer type helper people, and then the farmers call we, you know, let's say we, someone would do all of that to say, okay, now there is a, like you have a pool, there's a pool of agricultural workers on the available that then the farmers can call and say, I need someone. Kind of like the union for electricians or the union hall company. Job, yeah, so temporary foreign workers, it's rare for them to have open work permits. Okay. Um, temporary but foreign workers. But if they're working for the temp agency, we can then put it out. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I don't know if that think that works. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I, don't I haven't heard it. Really it's a really yeah. 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 well, interesting it's a idea. Real, yeah, that's it. That's a, that's a interesting yeah. thing. The only thing to caveat to that is that these workers are provided with housing and there are certain yeah. other things that goes along yeah. with it. Buses Exactly, and um, they are almost always working. There's not a lot of like downtime, so it's going to be very difficult to have a worker sitting around waiting on a call for a week. 
uh, two weeks or so on. So there would be some amount of logistical nightmare that is concerned. But then that's thinking outside of the box. I, I'd say. Yeah, I, I'll definitely bring that. Like I've never heard that suggestion. Yeah, so that's a never great heard suggestion that one. about a, a recruitment agency. Yeah. Any other question? So sure that is a really, really good idea because there's a lot of inefficiencies with how it works for agriculture right now. Mm -hmm. Because you, yeah, you bring people up for two months and this farmer brings like it's so. Anyways, it makes a lot of sense. But my question's on the um, Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. Uh, so in Norfolk County, I have a lot of seasonal workers. Um, in our case, I have a a person who's working on our farm and they want to immigrate and we want to employ them and they're a general farm worker, is this, is this probably a very good avenue for helping make that happen? It, it could be. I probably want to talk to you yeah. more like afterwards or like in the next, you know, next week about it or, or you send an email tomorrow. Um, a couple of things that aren't on the slide. So in that demand skills category, the person needs to have at least high school education which I hear can be an obstacle. And also they need to have uh, what's called the Canadian Language Benchmark 4, which is a very a basic level of English. Or French. Yeah. Or French. Yeah. CLB 4 is also the requirement for citizenship, so you know, CLB 4 is kind of the standard. But well, we, we would like to get more uh, people from agriculture in through that in-demand skills. We, we'd heard there was a need for it, but yet I would say uptake hasn't been uh, hasn't been that high. And partly it, it might be maybe maybe a lot of the agricultural workers who are here maybe they don't have high school or maybe the language is not quite there. Or maybe they're we don't take uh, agricultural workers from the uh, seasonal agricultural uh, program. There, but the people who come from Get an LMIA to um, think our, uh, our eligible. So there are a few wrinkles, a few wrinkles, but uh, I'd love to hear, hear more about it. Can you elaborate on the in-demand uh, stream for construction, but is only there with positions? 